vast, beautiful, and to many of us, local. The Sacramento San Joaquin Delta is one of the largest estuaries in California. It extends across the west coast and mixes the salt water entering from the bay with the fresh water of the inland rivers. It houses around 500 different plant and animal species, such as the iconic Delta Smelt. Though each deserves their own spotlight, today I want to talk about one species in particular, an ancient species of fish that remains practically unknown to most. My name is Trin, and this is my mini documentary of sorts on green sturgeon, the Delta's disappearing prehistoric fish. My main goal with this project was not just to examine the characteristics and threats of the species, but to convey what I've learned into a sculpture. One portion of this video will cover general information, and the other will center more around my artistic process. By the end, I hope I will make you all appreciate this amazing animal just a little bit more. So, where do we start? Well, green sturgeon are these large, rare fish that have remained practically unchanged for almost 200 million years. I mean, they can't even look like a dinosaur. These animals can reach upwards of 7 feet long and survive until they're 70. Compared to the more famously known white sturgeon, they differ in obviously color and certain physical attributes such as a pointier snout. The reason many of us might not have heard of them is because they're one of the few species we don't really eat caviar from. If you don't know, caviar comes from sturgeons, and it's said that the meat and the eggs from green sturgeon are poisonous, but I don't think that's exactly entirely true. Just because we don't kill them for caviar though, doesn't mean that they don't face other notable threats, but I'll get into that in more detail later. They're an andronomous species, which means they can live in both salt and fresh water. They spend most of their adult life in the ocean, but when it comes time to spawn every three to five years, the population near California makes this long journey towards the San Francisco Bay during the spring and head towards sections of the upper Sacramento River to lay their eggs. During early winter, the adults head back to the ocean while the babies grow up and head downstream towards the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta um, once they are juveniles. Here, they stay for about a few few years and grow quite rapidly. Within two years, they grow to be around two and a half to three feet long. Afterwards, they make their way towards the ocean, just like their parents, to continue the cycle all over again. Green sturgeon mature around 15 years old, and this fact, combined with how they primarily only spawn in one location, means they're especially susceptible to habitat changes that could have a huge effect on their population down the line. And most of these threats exist within their experience in the Delta. They used to be an abundant source of food for native people, but over the years have declined in numbers to the point that they were listed as a threatened species under the U.S. Endangered Species Act in 2006. Their population today stands around 10 to 12,000 and seem to be doing better, but many of the threats that they face still continue to exist today. I have compiled five types of threats and listed them vaguely in the order of prevalence. I'll be talking about water, contamination, microplastics, other animals, and direct human activity. Firstly, water. I use the word water by itself because there's so many aspects about water that have significantly impacted green sturgeon. If I were to list which factors have affected them most, it would be this one, or more specifically, water diversion. Water diversion refers to us redirecting the water for our own purposes. We use a lot of water for agriculture especially. Thousands of farmers need access to the fresh water provided by the Delta, and so pathways, dams, all that are built just so that water can reach the farms. This poses a huge problem to green sturgeon because it impedes on their migration. They might not be able to reach their spawning sites if the flow isn't strong enough. It gives both adults and juveniles fewer pathways to travel through, and they can even get stuck behind barriers. This issue doesn't affect um, green sturgeon alone, but most fish species that travel within the same rivers. The more water traveling out of the delta means less is available inside for these animals to live in. I also want to talk about the drought, which I'm sure is a problem we are all aware of. 2021 was one of our driest years to date. We are no strangers to droughts here in California, but if these same conditions don't change over a certain amount of years, that could practically eradicate this whole species. 
High temperatures and less water mean fewer green sturgeon eggs will be able to survive. They are very sensitive to the conditions of the environment around them. They grow best at around 15 degrees Celsius, but if it goes below 11 or above 20 degrees Celsius, it's been shown that it causes reduced growth, deformities, and even death. I hosted an interview with Mark Bessia, who is an environmental scientist at the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. He's been conducting studies on the migration of juvenile green sturgeon for a couple of years now, and so I reached out to him for his thoughts on the species and its threats. I asked him, how does the demand of water relate to green sturgeon? One of the, one of the equations in simplified equation in fish, fisheries is more water equals more fish. So mm. as you're well aware, there's not enough water all the years for, to supplement all the needs for agriculture, urban uses, and fisheries. So everybody suffers a little bit. So I also asked Mark about what he thinks we can do to save the habitat of green sturgeon. I think one of the one of the main things is probably um, making sure all their diversion diversions are screened. That's going to pre pre prevent um, you know loss of fish, and then some of these efforts to we're not sure how effective they are because they're a, you know benthic species they stay on the bottom, but mm -hmm. um, where they're doing trying to do more floodplain restoration where the you know the river can flood out of its channels and areas and provide more habitat and that'll actually even if the sturgeon don't occupy that habitat it kind of increases the food web in the delta so mm -hmm. in an indirect way it'll provide them more food as as young fish to to eat and survive so and there's also projects in the delta to restore um, some of the upland into a tidally influenced habitat uh, we know white sturgeon will occupy really shallow areas. Um, when high tides, they'll come up and feed in those shallow areas. We, we haven't really documented that much in green sturgeon yet, but I'm, I'm pretty confident they do the same thing. So um, in areas where we, you know, take say agricultural land and return it to, uh, you, know, you know, like intertidal land or marsh habitat, um, the, the young fish and even the adults will come up there and, and be able to forage. So there's, there's ongoing projects. In fact, I just got an email from one of the people I first started working with here on this project, he's working for a consultant company as well, asking for some data on um, green sturgeon use in the San Joaquin system. So they, they aren't documented as spawning in the San Joaquin system, but they do, as juveniles, do a lot of wandering. We, we typically pick up a number of our fish that we tag on um, by acoustic tag detection in the San Joaquin side. So they're working on projects there to restore some of that, and, and those fish will be able to those provide more habitat for them to actually go up and forage in these shallow waters and, and grow quicker. As an individual, we can also help by avoiding thirsty crops and meats like beef when choosing what to eat. Thirsty crops refer to those that require a significantly large amount of water to grow. These include corn, potatoes, almonds. Of course, you don't have to cut them out completely, rather just avoid consuming them on a regular basis. Other large-scale solutions outside of what Mark mentioned would be more action to fight climate change and to build fewer barriers and diverting pathways within the Delta system. Both would also provide more habitat and suitable conditions for green sturgeon to thrive. The second factor I want to go over is contamination. Contamination of Delta water specifically. I suppose this can also fall under water, but I wanted a section to focus on this in more detail. Contamination isn't super high of a threat to green sturgeon primarily because they spend most of their lives living in the ocean, which has lower levels of contamination compared to the delta, where chemicals can reach higher concentrations more easily. Despite that, it's still an important issue to consider, especially because other species that don't travel as much are at an even greater risk. The first pollutant I want to talk about is mercury. Mercury is a type of metal and can enter water sources by way of industrial wastes, mining wastes, and incorrectly disposed of trash like light bulbs. This is especially significant when you consider California's history of mining for gold. Miners would use this material to better collect gold, but in the process, release it into the water and atmosphere. Mercury is then converted to methylmercury by bacteria and other processes once in a lake or river. Marine animals absorb methylmercury from their food and from water as it passes over their gills. Mercury is tightly bound to proteins in all fish tissue, including muscle. As it climbs up the food web, mercury bioaccumulates in larger predators like green sturgeon. High concentrations can lead to neurological changes, shorten lifespans, and increase incapacity to produce offspring. They are more likely to struggle with swimming and possess a weakened sensory and motor system too. 
Another way is through household hazardous waste. Household hazardous waste refers to any unwanted household product labeled as flammable, toxic, corrosive, or reactive. You're meant to throw these away by dropping them off at the correct facilities or making sure they're contained properly. I implore anyone listening to look up the materials you use and which one of them are considered hazardous and making sure you throw them away correctly afterwards as well as where the nearest facilities uh, for waste are. Some hazardous wastes that contain mercury are fluorescent light bulbs, thermostats, thermometers, and novelty items like light-up shoes. When they end up in landfills, they break down and can travel by way of water. Another pollutant that can affect green sturgeon is selenium. Selenium is a mineral that occurs naturally in the soils of the San Joaquin Valley and get washed up into the delta through irrigation runoff. It is also a component of pollution from delta oil refineries. There was actually this huge story during the 1980s where irrigation water runoff caused massive reproduction defects in surrounding water birds, and they tried their best to reduce the selenium concentrations in the agricultural drain water, but of course they can't get rid of all of it. Similar to the water birds, selenium can negatively impact the reproductive systems of green sturgeon. They found high concentrations in certain fish species and that it causes deformalities in their embryos. In addition, they can also become less fertile. Lastly, I'd like to talk about a few other contaminants. The ones I didn't yet mention include fertilizer, pesticides, and oil pollution. Two of these come mainly from agricultural processes. Fertilizer and pesticides are used on crops to make them grow faster or become less appealing to insects, but this comes at a cost. When they're watered or when it rains, these chemicals can make their way to natural water sources, such as rivers um, where green sturgeon inhabit. Fertilizers contain nitrogen and phosphorus that contribute to the formation of harmful algal blooms in water given the right conditions. They deprive the surrounding area of oxygen when they die, leaving little to none for the surrounding species to breathe. Pesticides, oils, and other similar materials can kill off animals upon prolonged contact. This applies especially to smaller animals like amphibians, shellfish, and water birds. This can alter the delta food web, making it harder for green sturgeon to find food. Solutions to avoid contamination would be to first throw things away accordingly, and if you're unsure, you can always look it up on the internet. On a large scale, we can find better ways for contaminated water from farms to be diverted away from delta systems and for them to be treated. Microplastics are the third type of threat I want to talk about. They've been found within a multitude of marine species. Human activity leads to plastics and chemicals produced manufacturing them invading marine ecosystems. People often throw plastic waste away onto the streets and even directly into the water sometimes. Wastewater floods and the wind can carry them into rivers and oceans. This can end up in the bodies of animals like the green sturgeon. Though not a super prominent threat to the species specifically, green sturgeon remain at a higher risk compared to other fish because they are demersal, meaning they live close to the seafloor. They eat small organisms like zooplankton, shrimp, and isopods off the floor, and while doing so, can accidentally consume microplastics. Microplastics can physically damage organs and leach dangerous chemicals that can affect immune function and hinder growth and reproduction. You can help at home lessen the impacts of microplastics, mainly by making sure you're not dumping your garbage improperly. I would also advise um, avoiding a single-use plastic when possible because they're so light and they fly away, making up a large majority of what ends up in marine environments. Facilities that treat water commonly use filters to get rid of larger pieces of plastic, but the smaller it gets, the harder it becomes to remove it from the water. The best solution overall is just to find ways to implement large-scale use of plastic alternatives. The fourth type of threat I want to talk about is other animals. I want to kick it off first with what Mark thinks about the predators of this species. Um, the, one of the principal things I think is what, what we've kind of learning is um, based on the water year is really highly correlated to survival to the even to the juvenile phase. So. You know, every year they'll go up the Sacramento River and spawn, but if the water, if there's a, not very much flow, you know, the, the water's clearer and the predation rate is really high on eggs and the larvae. So they're a really susceptible predation, particularly to some, you know, non-native fish species. We're finding out that, you know, catfish are a really significant predator on the early life stages, more so than maybe striped bass, or largemouth bass. So. Um, if you've got a really big water year, you know, the water's colder, more turbid, those eggs and larvae have better chance to survive. And once once they reach the juvenile stage, say, um, you know, 
250 millimeter to 300 millimeter fork length, which is, you know, 10, say 10 to 12 inches. Mm -hmm. um, not many um, other fish or predators will eat them. As Mark says, predation is only really prevalent during their early stages of life. Though it's only during this little window of time that they can be eaten, it's still a sizable threat to green sturgeon. Catfish and striped bass aren't even native to California, meaning they were brought in by humans either accidentally or deliberately. I can only assume that they're purposely introduced so that there's more to fish. Because of that, I'm sure it's debatable whether introducing these species was worth like, some green sturgeon being killed off. The reason why I didn't call this factor just predation is because I also wanted to talk about the Asian clam. They, of course, don't eat green sturgeon, but have a massive impact on the food webs, thus by proxy negatively impacting them as well. They are an invasive species that contributed a large part to the decline in the bay's ecological productivity. They're voracious eaters and feed on the foundation of all marine ecosystems, cytoplankton. This strips other animals from a much more plentiful supply, if not for Asian clams. They also absorb any contaminants in the water and incorporate it into their tissue. Green sturgeon are not known to eat them, but those who do are exposed to all the substances the clams has accumulated. I haven't found much in ways to solve this issue besides one experiment in Lake Tahoe that found putting rubber tarps over concentrations of Asian clams effective on a pretty small scale. Other than that, I don't really have any solutions to provide in relation to other animals. The last type of threat I want to go over is direct human activity. This primarily has to do with fishing. It's actually illegal to take green sturgeon out of the water, and if you're fishing for sport, you're required to equip a specific hook that makes releasing them much easier. There's a lot of rules surrounding what to do when you accidentally catch one, such as making sure not to play with them to exhaustion, and when you're about to release them, to face them towards the current until they swim away. Despite this, illegal poaching still exists. There are people who fish for green sturgeon to then sell its meat or eggs on the black market. Chronic toxicity and poaching are the main reasons why we don't see sturgeon to grow to massive sizes such as 15 to 20 feet. In addition to poaching, they are also prone to be hit by ship propellers of freight ships and sport fishing vessels when traveling through the bay or narrow straits. 10% of Atlantic sturgeon mortality occurs because of this reason. Green sturgeon have no avoidance behavior, so it's harder for them to navigate among these obstacles. Lastly, they are sometimes caught by fisheries who are aiming for other species like halibut, but are mistakenly caught as well. We don't actually know the extent of damage it causes green sturgeon when they're caught and released, but I did see while researching that the NOAA, or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, are actually conducting research around the long-term effects of this. The only solution I can provide for this section is to possibly set specific paths boats and ships should travel on, but that might be a lot of work for honestly very little change. Other than that, I guess just don't buy fish goods off the black market. <laughs> All five types of threats, water, contamination, microplastics, other animals, and direct human activity have contributed to the decline of green sturgeon in some way, some more significantly than others. You might be wondering now, why should I even care about what happens to them? Well, to be honest, whether they exist or go extinct will have little effect on us, so I can see why one may not initially find any value in learning any of this information. But I want to say to those people that though they might not care about green sturgeon specifically, many of the threats I have talked about also apply to a variety of animals across different ecosystems. The fish that you eat or the water that you drink are both impacted by microplastics for one. The more we make ourselves aware of the issues that affect them, the better choices we can make in reducing our impact. That is one of the greatest lessons I've learned through my ecology class. Green sturgeon just happens to be one of those cool animals that might go away if we don't do anything about saving them. They are a rare megafauna of California, and to me, something to be proud of living amongst. And that is why I decided to make a sculpture of one. So, without further ado, here's the fun part of the video where I talk about how I made this. This ecology class has really made me think about my impact as an artist, and one of the main things I kept in mind during this project is how to reduce what I throw away throughout this process, as well as utilize what I already have around me instead of buying new things. And so um, I'm actually super proud that I only had to buy like very few things that I really couldn't get on my own or for very cheap or used. <laughs> I actually kind of listed them in the order of how much trash they had <laughs> because when you compare big break 
um, to Lazy and Marina, it's practically like night and day. Um, I think that just says a lot about the cleanup efforts at Big Break versus like the cleanup efforts at other parks and fishing spots. So Big Break Regional Shoreline, what did I find here? I actually didn't find practically anything. I came out with this like bag and a, a grabber and I walked around the park, but I really couldn't find anything besides like this, I think to go box um, that I ended up not using. Despite me not finding many materials here, what's also really special about this place is I'm actually planning to display this sculpture there um, in the coming week at the visitor center. So if you're watching this beforehand, you should totally come and visit the visitor center at Big Break Regional Shoreline. Um, my sculpture is going to be up for about a week in there, so yay! I actually got a chance to talk to a naturalist who worked here at Big Break by the name of Misty Marsh. And during our meeting, um, I told her about my project and we just talked about green sturgeon and um, what they actually do at the park. Um, has any of your work helped conserve um, green sturgeon, like specifically? So we know, um, I think it is kind of known one of the, the threats to green sturgeon is um, habitat loss and habitat degradation or, you know, lower quality of habitat. So the park district does help preserve some land. We have land right here at Big Break um, that is protected and preserved. So I would like to think, yes, what we do does help, you know, working for the park district is helping, this conservation is helping. But it's not just what the park district does. You know, there's a park district has partnerships with many different agencies and work together to really determine what should be protected and what should be preserved. What are some mistakes or things most people ignore um, that unintentionally harm local marine life? So this is where we do a lot of our work. Um, mm -hmm. We like to share with the public, here are some great things that you could do to help protect the wildlife. Um, one of them is if you're fishing, obeying fishing regulations, like laws are put in place to, to protect um, fisheries. So obeying, obeying laws when it comes in laws and regulations when it comes to fishing is a great one. And you know, not leaving fishing line or hooks out um, not polluting the water, which not all pollution is intentional, right? So um, many of us live in, in residential areas where there are storm drains and there are sewer drains. And a lot of those are draining straight to the delta or straight to the creeks and rivers nearby. And so making sure only water goes down those drains, not having a lot of organic material like leaves or grass clippings, not washing your car where your the soap is going to go down those drains and end up in our waterways is a is a great everyday way where we could help um, protect the quality of water. Also, conserving water. Um, we most people in our area, two out of every three people in California are getting their water, um, you know, from the the Delta watershed is what we say. And that, that includes the Sacramento River and the San Joaquin River and all the tributaries. Um, but if we use less water, that's less water we're taking out of the river. Um, and so another, another obvious one is don't litter. <laughs> Not all litter is intentional, but, you know, even making sure that um, when you're around, when you're outside and you're using public garbage cans and stuff, if the garbage can is overflowing, not, not putting your garbage in there because it's likely to get blown out. Um, so both not intentionally littering, not intentionally littering and going out of your way to make sure a lot of your waste, your garbage is not unintentionally becoming litter. My second location, which is the one that's kind of in the middle, um, is actually called Antioch Marina. Um, there was a lot of people when I first visited, but on my second visit, which is the one that I recorded, um, it was super foggy and no one was there. I, I, I couldn't really find much, too much at least. Um, there was some, of course, but um, not nothing a lot. 
Um, I did manage to find, I think, just some, like, plastic containers and whatnot from this place that I did end up using. The last location was Lazy M Marina, which was by far the worst. Um, it was actually the one where you can just see trash, like, when you walked up in there, like, next to you. There was trash, like, near the water. There was trash in the water. And it was just all types, too. Like, there were bottles, especially, like, a lot of single-use plastic, packaging. Um, there was especially a lot of these, like, worm containers, which um, I recognize because my dad buys them to um, get worms in. And um, people use them to fish, of course. So I, I saw a lot of that. And um, I ended up actually, like, picking a few up. They, they were clean, don't worry. I ended up picking a few up to use in my own sculpture. So, yeah, I, I got a large portion of recycled material from here because there's so many <laughs> two of the best things i actually got here was um a bicycle inner tube if you know what i mean and just actually just the rocks lying around the bicycle tube um i used um to create two of the organs um for the internal section of the fish it turned out to be actually pretty useful i didn't expect to use it for that but um that was pretty neat uh, the rocks um, I just used to decorate the base, the wood base that the sculpture would um, in the end sit on. So the first step after that was to make the base and I decided to use cardboard because um, I didn't want to spend money on buying anything but also because it's pretty sturdy and if, especially if I layer it, um, it'll make sure that this, uh, the sculpture doesn't fall in on itself. So I'm just going to let the rest of my process like kind of just speak for itself, but I did want to talk about how I utilized some of my learning into what I decided to do for my sculpture. Um, the main thing was that, you know, by collecting all the trash, um, I diverting that trash from the delta um, and away from animals that could be harmed from it. Um, this did, and I didn't end up using uh, every one of them, but the ones I did use, um, I did mainly use on the body um, for the most part. You'll see better later on when I'm actually working on um, the organs of the fish, but um, I specifically chose to use this old light bulb I had. Uh, I originally wanted to use it to recreate a kidney, but because like fish kidneys are kind of look like a string almost, um, I couldn't exactly use it for that, so I kind of just incorporated it into... Um, a liver instead. Um, I actually used like the the bike tube that I mentioned earlier to make the kidney and the intestines. Um, other things I incorporated into the sculpture was um, putting little bits of plastic into the stomach. If you didn't see that um, earlier, I just cut up little pieces of materials that I've collected and just kind of just shoved them inside the stomach. Um, besides that, I also created the gills. I don't know if you saw those, but I, when I made the gills, I made them out of the box of plant fertilizer. I just cut it up and painted over it. Um, and I also, in between the, the two layers of gills, if you know what I mean, um, I actually used um, parts of an oil, uh, motor oil container. So I, I thought that was pretty cool. And um, for the base, I used a lot of newspaper to paper mache, kind of like the basic shape of the fish. And though it's, it's kind of loose, um, I thought it's kind of a good connection to how much agriculture connects to green sturgeon. Um, and, you know, as, you, as you'll see, most of the newspaper that I'll use is like advertising food, supermarkets and whatnot. And for all the issues that I couldn't directly represent in the sculpture, I decided I wanted to actually just write them out in these super short uh, descriptions or blurbs and just kind of stick them onto the sculpture so that viewers who do visit the Big Break Center um, can actually just read about them.